Welcome to Start Dakota, a show by Startup Sioux Falls where we dispel misconceptions about starting a business, uncover unique challenges faced by founders, highlight today's problem solvers, and build a stronger startup community for tomorrow. This project is powered by the SBA. Now, here's your host, Brienne Maynard. Hello, and welcome back to our show. Uh, I'm Brian Maynard, Executive Director of Startup Sioux Falls, and we exist to help make starting a business easier in the greater Sioux Falls community. We are talking with our SBA community navigators, uh, spoke organizations that are going to be benefiting from the million dollar grant that our organization received back in November. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Laura Smith Hill, who is with Lutheran Social Services of South Dakota. It is a pleasure to have you here today. I've known you for some time now, but I really, I'm so excited to get to know you better. So I would love to start by just having you talk a little bit about yourself, your journey, your role at LSS. So I am Laura and I just love what I get to do in the Sioux Falls community. My role at Lutheran Social Services Center for New Americans has been a very rewarding one, and that has a couple of different facets to it. Mm -hmm. And it has been intriguing and rewarding enough to keep me here in Sioux Falls for as long as I have been and with LSS for going on 21 years now. 21 years? We're so lucky to have you, oh. honestly. And you've traveled, right? So you've you've uh, lived in Japan, um, other other places. So I feel like you you truly do have a unique perspective on um, how to truly support um, those that are coming in from the outside. I just I appreciate that so much about you. Um, I guess so. As I was um, kind of looking through why it's so important that we support new Americans and immigrants as part of our entrepreneurial ecosystem, I stumbled upon a statistic that says that more like more new Americans and immigrants are are entrepreneurial and starting businesses more so than those that were born here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this? And and how has that helped propel? the programming that you are providing to these folks that are coming in from outside. Mm -hmm. I have seen that. It, it has, it really resonates in conversations that I've had with students. So, mm -hmm. so I have had that journey of yes, living in other countries and working in the classroom. So providing direct support to refugees and immigrants, multilingual adults, mm -hmm. as I pr often say, yep. And in those conversations, it, it has come up pretty regularly mm -hmm. that they have this really organic entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we have these conversations about the type of work that you did before coming to the United States, it is not at all uncommon for people to say they had a, they had a shop. Mm -hmm. So in a couple of different languages, and I've been able Sometimes I can cross culturally communicate because I know this one word that is high leverage, like the word Dukan. Dukan. In several different languages is a store owner or a shop okay. owner. A shop, like a small shop that a family establishes in their community to solve problems. Interesting. To meet the needs of their neighborhood. So it is really common and there are not a lot of barriers for people to do that mm -hmm. in their own initial, you know, their, their home country, their country right. of origin. It's, it looks a little different than right. it does here in the United States, yep. but that drive is there. It's so natural for people mm -hmm. to start up a business. Absolutely. And, and when we say immigrants and refugees, it's hard, like that, that means a lot of different things. And there are so many different communities that fall underneath that umbrella. I'm curious, um, can you talk a little bit about, for those that aren't familiar with the landscape of Sioux Falls, South Dakota and our, our region, um, what are the most prevalent communities that are coming into Sioux Falls? That, that is a great question. It's something that changes. Yeah. It ebbs and flows. You've seen a lot over 20 years. Indeed, yes, I have. And, and our program at large has seen uh, from what I have been able to research, 47 different nationalities have been through 
just our education program mm -hmm. alone. Wow. Uh, but we do serve both refugees and immigrants. Yeah. So uh, currently, a lot of Spanish speakers mm -hmm. here. We see people from Africa mm -hmm. coming in. Uh, there, there's a trickle of Ukrainians sure. and, and very few Afghanis, uh, okay. but there might be some family members here and there okay. that are being uh, reunified. And in fact, a, a lot of what happens in Sioux Falls is family reunification mm -hmm. from, from a refugee perspective. Mm -hmm. It's people being reunited with loved ones that already live in the Sioux Falls community. Yeah. Like what you hear so far? Make sure to never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. Now, back to the show. Absolutely. Well, you said the word Ukrainian, and that um, word has been kind of at the forefront of all of our minds and hearts, most recently with all of the unrest overseas. Mm -hmm. Do you see, do you, you anticipate more of an influx of Ukrainian refugees coming to Sioux Falls over time? That's something that our uh, resettlement director is closer to the pulse of. Sure. But right now, I know that our agency doesn't have a lot of information okay. about how soon that would happen. Sure. I I wouldn't be surprised yep. that we see some of that because there already is a strong Ukrainian community you bet. here in Sioux Falls. So there will I've be family it, members mm -hmm. that decide, well, now is a good time to make this shift. Mm -hmm. And join in the experience of what some of our relatives yeah. are doing here in Sioux Falls. So 47 different nationalities. Mm -hmm. I have to imagine that creating a curriculum that is effective across all platforms is difficult. How do you modify programming to meet the, the specific needs of each one of these communities beyond the language barrier? Beyond the language barrier? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, so I'm assuming that most that come in don't speak the language. They mm -hmm. speak their native language. Mm -hmm. So that's potentially not probably not 47 different languages, but right. you know, different dialects, things like that. So I realize that that's a hurdle. I mean, it's something that we as a startup organization have had to overcome. It's something that we were not equipped to help support, which is why we're embarking on this journey to bring this programming to underserved communities that already have that relationship and some skill set to be able to communicate mm -hmm. in, in such a way. But uh, again, beyond that, like, cause I, you know, again, I realize that that's going to be a challenge and that's something that we're really focused on is being able to translate but I guess I want to dig in more to you know I think everybody's um, definition of entrepreneur is maybe a little bit different and depending on where you're from that means something a little bit different mm -hmm. so how are you how are you digging in and exploring and figuring out how you can be the most effective to those individuals you know, based on the communities that they came from? And I know that's a big question, mm -hmm. but what are, can you give some examples, I guess, of, of, of curriculum you've modified or mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. things that have come to light over your 20 years in this role that have been effective in helping these folks acclimate themselves to the Sioux Falls area and yeah. the business community? Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent and insightful question. <laughs> it is one of the delightful challenges yeah. of the work that we do in our in our little education program mm -hmm. and when I say little it's between four and seven hundred students a year wow. typically it's not little <laughs> yeah it's it's relative it feels small because yeah. we're morning afternoon and evening yep. and we do classroom based so we'll have a group of five to ten in this room five mm -hmm. to ten in this room yeah um, so it's it's really uh, such a privilege yeah. to, to work with so many people. But uh, yeah, what an interesting question. We do have the opportunity for a lot of customization, mm -hmm. adaptation, yep. having really culturally responsive instruction, mm -hmm. culturally appropriate, culturally responsive. Yeah. And when we're able to, and when appropriate, ling linguistically sure. appropriate instruction. I have to imagine it takes a lot of resources to get this off the ground, you know, from the linguistics to, you know, the communication and just the bodies to be there morning, noon, and night, because it sounds like things are operating, not at all hours, but yeah. a big chunk of the day. It is. It so. is. Yeah. Well, our primary resource is talented staff. Yeah. Really. 
yeah. uh, with a creative team that's just loves what they do mm -hmm. like I do, yeah. we're able to accomplish so much. And resources that, that support those talented mm -hmm. individuals. So I work with typically about 13 different grants, federal, private, wow. and local, private, did I say state? Mm -hmm. Federal, state, and local. Yeah grants to provide this array of programming and the creative curricula yep. that we design. So we do, uh, we customize our instruction so that it is culturally relevant to mm -hmm. our students, that it, it bridges them to their new home, their mm -hmm. lived experience here in our community. Yeah. Uh, we do something really creative. So we don't rely on just one curriculum typically. Mm -hmm. We re we resource pre-designed curricula, but our team, we meet once a month. Okay. And we have a topic of the month when it comes to our English language classes. Yep. We do curriculum development days where a team of instructors meets together at each level of instruction mm -hmm. and they design the content start to design the content for the subsequent month. Mm. So we have about a two to three week period where our teachers are all working together to design something that meets the needs of the students they're working with right now. Yeah, And we'll never know everything about every culture that we work with, but we have some of the tools and skills to be adaptive to the learners that we face in the classroom. Wow. And we do things that are uh, like customized curriculum design in collaboration with local employers mm -hmm. so that when we create our workforce training classes, mm -hmm. they're informed by the immediate needs of the workforce and, and also meet up with the interests of our student body. Wow. Students and skill sets. And, and really we have to be really uh, informed and we use research-based practices to make sure we're leveling things appropriately. Because like you said, when people come in from other countries, they have a varied background yeah. and experience with the English language. We'll have people that are just really starting off from uh, level one mm -hmm. and then individuals that are pretty highly educated and have some mastery of the language. Yeah. And it might just be a pronunciation challenge or getting acclimated to our culture. So we work with that whole range. Yeah. So when we were selecting which uh, spoke organizations would be best to work with, it was a no brainer with you guys. And the more you, sp you talk about your resources and your process, like it's just so apparent to me that you're equipped to, to, you know, take on these challenges with grace and strength and, I just, I just have to wonder, like, do you have a story, a success story or a story of failure that you would, would care to share about someone who, you know, you, you help support and it is thriving in the business community, either here in Sioux Falls or otherwise? Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there would be many. Yeah. One, one spring. I'm glad there's many. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and success, that's one of the beautiful opportunities of entrepreneurship right. itself is that people get to either at the beginning of the process or through the trial and error of yeah. it, come upon their own definition of what is success. Right. What, what does that look like for them? Uh, but one thriving business in Sioux Falls is uh, on, on 10th street mm -hmm. and it is a, uh, it is a grocery store that serves really a range of ethnic communities in the city. And in fact, when we when we resettle a new family, that's one of the places where we take people to get their culturally appropriate food oh, awesome. when they arrive to America. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a family-owned business. It is a grocery store on East 10th Street, okay. and it is bustling. Huh. They they and they really do have a multifaceted model. Yep because they are providing services other than the store itself. Absolutely. Um, they provide uh, financial uh, supports, uh, taxes for people, uh, help people with travel needs. So really? they do a lot more than I even know. Yeah. 
um, but a really successful and thriving family owned ethnic business. That's community. fantastic. Hey, this is Jeff Hayward with Startup Sioux Falls. Welcome back to the Co-Starters Challenge, a recurring segment where we'll provide some tips for launching or growing your startup, as well as an action you can take called fieldwork. Your customer's alternatives are your competition, and there are two kinds you should identify. Direct competitors sell similar products or services as you. Think Coca-Cola and Pepsi. But there's also indirect competition. When Henry Ford built the first automobile, he had no direct competitors. No one had ever seen anything like it. His competition were the other methods of transportation available to people at the time, horses, buggies, and trains. He had indirect competition, and you will too. Okay, here's your field work. Take another pass on identifying your competition, both direct and indirect. Keep in mind your indirect competition could be a customer not buying anything. Like my wife when she's offered Pepsi at a restaurant when they don't offer Coke. That's all for this episode. Good luck on your field work, and I'll see you next month. How have you seen the um, the immersion of new Americans and immigrants with the Sioux Falls community? And I'll preface this by saying I feel like we've come a long way as a community. When I was a kid in in school, there weren't a lot of kids that didn't look like me, and if they you know if they were in my class, they kind of stuck out, right? Um, and I see that landscape changing. In fact, I mean, there's there's statistics that are saying that our our, our current uh, makeup of our school district is 40 percent um, non-white, um, non-English speaking. Um, we've you know obviously got some challenges ahead of us as a community. How have you seen support, growth? You know personal growth within our own business community and, and how have those two worlds come together um, in, and, and helped each other through this process? Well, I've been, I've been in the work for, like we said, about 20 yeah. years. Yep. And, and I feel like it's more supportive mm -hmm. and inclusive yeah. than ever. And I feel like businesses and community members that are native to this area mm -hmm. are more inclusive uh, than ever yep. and intentional about that. Yep. That's really intentional about being a welcoming community. Mm -hmm. So I feel a lot of hope about yeah. the place that we're in right now. That's great. And, and it really resonates and it touches my heart mm -hmm. because of the friendships that I've been able to forge over the years with really diverse populations, mm -hmm. it's really endearing and uh, affirming Yeah, to see that echoed in our community. Absolutely. Yes. So we talked about, you know, modifying curriculum. And as we were putting this, this grant opportunity together, we're implementing a a program um, called Co-Starters, which is an accelerator program. And it, it has a curriculum in which I know that we're gonna have to modify to meet the needs of, of, of different communities, whether that's breaking up the courses by, you know, times times two and doing 20 weeks instead of 10. You know, I just, I can see that there's going to be some modifications needed. What in your mind is the biggest opportunity um, as we implement this program, having gone through the training now, and what, what are some of the greatest challenges that you're seeing um, that, that this programming could help overcome? Mm -hmm. Great, great question. Mm -hmm. I, I was so excited to go through the curriculum with, with all of our partners yeah. throughout the state. Yep. It is, I was really, really impressed. So my background is quite intensively in the adult learning theory mm -hmm. area. And I loved seeing things in the curriculum that resonate with research-based best practice mm -hmm. in the area of adult learning theory. Absolutely. And, and the, the way that things are broken down and, and really in a, a graceful and merciful way. I, I loved what one of the the creators said during our, during our training, during our training, he said something like, simplicity is challenging. It is, right? It is really challenging. And I think Einstein made some 
uh, shared wisdom back in the day about mm -hmm. it really takes it takes more intelligence to be able to make something so simple yep. uh, that someone with lower skills or less life experience can understand mm -hmm. it. And co-starters curriculum really does that. It takes something that can be really daunting and complex mm -hmm. and it breaks it down into digestible bites and yeah. it's really well written and designed. Uh, so I felt really hopeful about that. I think that's really promising. Mm -hmm. uh, adaptation opportunities, I'm sure we will start to discover as we, the first class I think is usually a pilot feel yeah. yep. where best laid intentions. And as, a, as an adult uh, instructor, mm -hmm. I, I am tasked with being versatile in that way, that when I see the responses of the learners in the room and mm -hmm. as I support this process for our other facilitators, mm -hmm. we're going to really respond in the best way we can to what the needs of the students are. Typically an opportunity with, uh, with any pre-designed curriculum, especially when it's getting into those complex mm -hmm. areas of sector specific business and industry training we find ourselves needing to spend more time on vocabulary. Yep. The, the curriculum that we get to work with in co-starters highlights bold faces, terminology that mm -hmm. is really key, uh, but I would anticipate that we'll find other words that might trip people up mm -hmm. that we need to spend more time on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's just an opportunity for partnering with the pre designed content to provide more scaffolds, more steps and break down and maybe spending a little more time on things for people that want to master that content, mm -hmm. but in order to get them to the next step, we just have to slow it down and spend more time with it. You must have an unending amount of patience. I just like, I get an aura from you that is just patient, kind, empathetic. Um, I just, I, I, I think the world of the work that you do, um, it's, this is intimidating. This process is intimidating for us. You know, I've had people ask, um, so what have you been doing for underserved communities? You know, what headway have you made? And I, I have to be honest and say not much. You know, we, we're doing the best that we can, but I don't even, I don't even truly know if we are. You know, I just, I feel like it's never enough. Um, do you feel that way? Like, do you get frustrated? Do you get impatient with with the progress that has been made over your years? Or do you feel satisfied with the work that you're doing? And do you feel like you're making enough impact? Mm -hmm. Another kind of loaded question, mm -hmm. but I, I, I feel this in the work that I do and I can't even imagine what that's like in your world. What a beautiful question. Challenging. Uh, I feel really fortunate and my patient ex patience extends to my own work too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like I have such an opportunity with every grant project, mm -hmm. just as with this one, mm -hmm. I get to focus on what this resource is able to do mm -hmm. and what is our best case scenario mm -hmm. of, as we invest our energies and our talents into this initiative, what impact can that make? And that's going to move the dial toward the big picture dream. Yeah. So I'm really patient What's about that. What's the big that. picture dream? What's your big picture oh. dream? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure how much time I spend on that. <laughs> I'm going to say how much time essence, we have to talk about it. <laughs> right. I, I think an essence of the big picture dream for me is more of those natural harmonious mm -hmm. connecting points and relationships mm -hmm. for communities that come from diverse backgrounds mm -hmm. and communities where their immigrant heritage is a couple generations removed from the present day. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I feel like in America, we, we pretty quickly uh, divert and, and that's so natural mm -hmm. from our ethnic heritage. Mm -hmm. And we have an opportunity with those that are more recent immigrants to our community um, to experience a diversity of 
values and cultures and and to see too where we really have so much in common mm -hmm. and and our our family's journeys are not are not that far removed no. from that experience no. but i know that I feel like for, inherently we all oh, want the same thing we do you know we and do. and the, we call it the american dream but yeah that can be a dream anywhere it is but oh. yeah Ugh. we have so many so much hope and opportunity Absolutely. in the United States, which is a draw mm -hmm. for, for the people that we get to work with. Absolutely. Yes. Oh my goodness. Welcome to the Business Minute, a recurring segment powered by the SBA, where we'll share business facts and resources available to entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. Small Business Administration. This is Sadie Swear, Executive Director of SDCEO East Women's Business Center. Did you know, in 2018, immigrants owned 18% of employer firms? The industries with the greatest share of immigrant workers were accommodation and food services, looking at 37% of those, and retail trade, 24% of those. Interested in starting a business or already own a business? There are many free resources available. One of those resources is Startup Sioux Falls Co-Starters Business Accelerator Program. Co-Starters is a 10-week program designed to provide you with the insights, relationships, and tools to turn your ideas into action and a sustainable business. Startup Sioux Falls is proud to partner with the following organizations to expand the delivery of the Co-Starters Business Accelerator. LSS Center for New Americans, MB, Dakota Resources, and Thunder Valley. We are offering this program through the Community Navigator Pilot Program, powered by the Small Business Administration. Learn more about co-starters and the Community Navigator Pilot Program at startupsufalls.com backslash start. What have, what, What's something like big that you have learned by supporting new Americans and immigrants? I have to imagine that your your worldview is obviously a lot more robust than than a lot of us that grew up mm -hmm. here. You know, we've lived in the Midwest our whole lives and I'm I'm lumping everybody into one category, which isn't always the case. I'm talking about myself, I guess, more than anything else where I feel like I'm not as cultured as I should be. And there's a an intimidation that comes along with that where if somebody doesn't speak like me, you know, has a different experience than I do, I feel intimidated. And I think that has been a barrier to, to diversifying the business community, especially like where people just feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. and they're not used to sitting in that uncomfort. Mm -hmm. How has that shaped you as a as a professional in this community and how have you helped to kind of bridge the the differences between you know the business communities and and the communities that you serve mm -hmm. i'm asking some big questions that is a big question because <laughs> i'm fascinated questions. i'm fascinated <laughs> what have i learned i get to practice an empathy that comes pretty naturally to me mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. But I understand that as being a real bridge yep. when people can tap into it. People are people. Mm -hmm. um, what I've learned in my practice is the value of slowing things down mm -hmm. and really being a great listener. Yep. Listening to what body language is saying mm -hmm. if someone is uncomfortable or if they're confused uh, and just being curious about it yeah having a curiosity when when there is even a cross-cultural misunderstanding sure. or something that might be uh, seem like a conflict yep I get to practice being curious about it rather than making assumptions because we can assume nothing when mm -hmm. it comes to different cultures and languages because we don't know what we don't know exactly leaning in with curiosity being a great listener 
and and being patient with language. Mm -hmm. uh, I have had the opportunity to live in another country where I didn't speak the native language. Mm -hmm. And I lived in a pretty small community mm -hmm. where people weren't speaking to me in my native language. Mm -hmm. I was treated with such warmth and hospitality. Yeah. I wasn't, um, it was very evident that my culture was not I didn't come from the same culture mm -hmm. and that that I didn't have enough historical context right. to really fit in there. Mm -hmm. um, but in being immersed in a culture and a country where I couldn't really communicate with ease, mm -hmm. I have a lot of understanding of what that's like. Yeah. And I can slow it down and I can use words that are much more accessible and common mm -hmm. instead of kind of what might not be mainstream yep. language or, you know, I'll just have a sensitivity to, well, that's a term that this person might not have heard before. Right. Let me just kind of check in and see. Uh, it's so, as a language learner, mm -hmm. it's pretty natural to save face. Yeah. That if it's way over our head, <laughs> we're just going to kind of smile uh -huh. and nod. Yep. And, like if you, you can't understand? hear in a loud room, same thing. Like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. Yep. you bet. Yeah, uh -huh. instead of having the courage and the vulnerability like, to say, I don't know what you're saying. I yeah. don't know. But it's, it's a real, the necessity is a really trusting relationship mm -hmm. to move, to move those connections, to move that integrative piece forward yeah. uh, because they have to trust a person who is still acquiring fluency in the language has to trust me enough that I'm going to negotiate meaning with them. I'm going to break it down and be patient and not judge them right. for their lack of knowledge yeah. or just not being fluent, which is a journey that takes decades mm -hmm. really. Why is it important that we invest in immigrant and refugee owned businesses? In your mind, I think beyond I have, workforce, oh. workforce, workforce, workforce. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the one of the wins that we have in investing in refugee and immigrant-owned businesses mm -hmm. is that it is important to retain those members of our community yeah. when our refugee and immigrant youth have an opportunity to express their gifts and talents. They have a sense of ownership in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel like they have a place here. Yep. And that's something that touches my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I think is really important as we see 40% of our school district being diverse in nature. Those kids having, those kids, those youth. Yeah having a place to express themselves and their gifts mm -hmm. is part of what's going to keep our community vibrant. Absolutely. It's going to build on the amazing things that are already happening. And for those that are adults that have been here a bit longer, maybe the parents and grandparents mm -hmm. of those youth, I really would like to see those families continue to thrive yeah. and to have the resources that they need um, sometimes it's as simple as having cultural food that's accessible to mm -hmm. them so that they feel like they're home in this community. Absolutely. So, yeah, aside from workforce. Yeah, uh, which is important. Uh, well, <laughs> Very it, important. But... The, future, the future workforce. If yeah. we look 10 and 20 years ahead, mm -hmm. we really want to be that community that acknowledges the value of providing a welcoming space yeah. for those individuals and that they can thrive in their their own businesses and in their families. For those that are, are listening, um, that live in the area or planning to, to move here or visit, which immigrant or uh, refugee-owned business do you recommend that they go and, and check out? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you frequent these businesses. Um, and I'm curious, I'm ready to bust open my, my wallet and support, but what do you think? What would be a good place to start? Oh my. And you can name more than one if you'd start. like to. Oh. <laughs> well, the restaurants are amazing. Yeah. That's an, that's an easy yes. Uh -huh. The grocery stores, 
grocery stores are a great experience. Uh huh. Because, you know, for some of my colleagues and I that were born in the United States, mm -hmm. in traveling to another country, we learned so much about it by going to its grocery store. Mm -hmm. And here in Sioux Falls, you can essentially travel around the world by just going into an ethnic-owned business. So mm -hmm. uh, before we buy the plane ticket, that's great research mm -hmm. on your future travel plans mm -hmm. is to, it's very low, very inexpensive. Yeah. Uh, and you, you get immersed, you know, you have a little bit of a taste of their language and culture. Right. Um, by stepping in those doors. A way to spice up your dinner too, right? Like try something a little different. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it, yes, yes. Well, and to me, that's food is an adventure. Oh my gosh, yes. And we are a foodie town, are we not? Yes. Every time a new restaurant opens, everybody flips out. Mm. <laughs> they want to be the first to try it. So I wholeheartedly yeah. agree with you. And there's so many great options. Um, I'm going to have to run to the grocery store after this. <laughs> yes. Well, Laura, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting this effort, this journey that we're on together, and for giving us grace and patience as we, uh, as a startup community, learn how to navigate these waters uh, better. Um, I just, I appreciate everything that you do for this community and how long that you've stuck with it. That means a lot. Um, so... We'll see you. We'll see you down the road. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah. So thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for Start Dakota. Visit our website at startupsufalls.com to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend to rate our show on iTunes. If you are a founder and aspiring entrepreneur, you can get started by visiting our website at startupsufalls.com slash start. Start Dakota is made possible by funding from the U.S. Small Business Administration. With this funding, Startup Sioux Falls is piloting an expanded version of its co-starters business accelerator program and providing additional resources to support underserved founders. Start with Startup Sioux Falls.